Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's presentation, our Power Options Radioactive Trading Open Forum Q&A session. It is great to see you all here this afternoon. I hope you all brought your questions. I see some already coming in as well, so that's fantastic. Um, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, what I'd like to do first is to just, uh, in the first 20 seconds that we have here, is just to, to make sure that everyone is hearing me okay. Uh, so if you have a moment, can you use the question pod there inside that GoToWebinar, GoToMeeting platform uh, to let me know that you're hearing me okay, that the sound is coming through correctly, um, that it's not truncated or broken or breaking up. I just want to make sure the sound has come through. We had an issue on Wednesday. I think it was a problem with the connection with GoToWebinar or some issues that they were having there, and I want to make sure that they've corrected the issue and that we're not having the same problem today. So far, Jack says good. Uh, Jill says sound good today. She was with us on Wednesday. TC says good. Okay. Drew says good. John and RG, fantastic. All right. Well, before we begin, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Mike Chupka. I'm the Director of Education here at Power Options. Uh, Power Options, of course, is a patented suite of search and analysis tools designed for self-directed options investors. We do support over 23 of the most commonly used option strategies. And with our tools, you can, of course, search across those strategies to identify only those positions that match your personal risk reward tolerance. Uh, you can then do further research and analysis, compare different strikes and different strategies. We also offer a powerful set of portfolio tools to help you paper trade, track, and manage your positions as well. Uh, Power Options has been in business for over 17 years, and I've had the great pleasure of working with Ernie's Renner and Power Options staff for the past 11 years. Uh, I do handle a lot of the coaching sessions, education, and obviously webinars on the site. Uh, the coaching sessions are important. Those of you that are currently on a free trial to Power Options or subscribers to Power Options or Radioactive Trading, you can go in and schedule one of those sessions at any time. They're completely free. It's essentially a 35 to 45 minute phone conversation with myself or Ernie. We will walk you through the tools on the site and answer any questions that you have. Now, our process and procedures for this afternoon's presentation, as many of you just did, if you have a question, uh, use the question pod to send that to us. Uh, so when you logged on to the webinar, the GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar platform appeared on your screen. So at any time during the presentation, just use that question pod to send us a question. Please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. We're scheduled to be here from 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. However, if we do have a high volume of questions, I'll be more than happy to stay on a little bit extra to make sure every question gets handled. Uh, this one here says we may not have time to answer all questions. We will. We'll make time to answer all the questions that come in. Now, your questions could really be about anything related to options trading or options investing. If you have a question about general options strategy and concepts, uh, concepts of uh, the Greeks, for example, the difference between a call and a put even, comparing a covered call to a naked put strategy, management techniques, that's all fair game. If you have questions about some of the tools on Power Options, if you're currently going through a trial or you are a subscriber to Power Options and you want to know some of the functionality of some of the tools that are available, that is fair game as well. If you have questions about the concepts of radioactive trading, we'll also be able to handle those also, as I use that in my personal account, up to 50 to 60% of my trading capital is invested in the radioactive trading techniques and has been for about the last six and a half to seven years. Now, our basic ground rules. Don't be shy. Please feel free to ask any questions that you want. This presentation is designed for you to have an open and free forum to have your questions answered. Be patient. There may be one or two questions ahead of yours, but we will try to get through them all, as I mentioned. We also want to encourage you to feel free to help us help others. If a question comes in um, from one of our attendees and I give uh, a response based on what I've done in my personal account or other discussions I've had over the years with other options investors, but you feel there's a different way at looking at something, maybe a different management technique that we didn't discuss, please feel free to use the question pod to send that to us. We'll share that with the rest of the audience as well. Uh, most important, let's have fun. Uh, it's the uh, end of the May expiration, the standard May expiration. Looks like we still have uh, two expiration cycles left for those of us doing weekly options. That would be the 22nd of May and the 29th of May as well. And uh, we're getting deeper here into the summer session of uh, 2015. So let's have some fun. Uh, the the uh, Memorial Day holiday coming up in about a week and a half or so, about a week and a 
few days there. Uh, so we'll get that break in the markets. Uh, but let's have some fun, get some good education under our belt, and get ready to enjoy our weekend as well. All right, so first question that has come in comes from Jack. Let me change our screen here. I'm going to go over to Power Options. Uh, Jack has said, I would appreciate your input. Uh, I currently have, uh, I currently trade high probability credit spreads, bear calls and bull put credit spreads, which mainly expire worthless. However, when there is a large market move, I monitor the delta of my short option. If it reaches a certain range, mid to high 20s, it's an alert. And if it zooms towards 40, I need to do something such as close the spread, buy back half or more of the short position, or buy additional long position, or what suggestions do you have? Thanks. Okay, Jack. Now, I'm not going to have the time to go over everything, of course. So what I'm going to do first is under the Power Options menu here underneath the main Home tab, if I click on Free Webinars, this, of course, takes us to the Archived Webinars section. Inside the uh, webinar section here, we have different tabs, Power Options Tools, Options Strategies, Options Concepts, and Requested Topics. Usually I put the recording of our uh, Q&A sessions here on Friday afternoon. One of the available webinars that's available for free is Managing Your Spread Positions. This is from November of 2014. Now I'm also going to send a link to everyone in the chat window. So it's powerop.com slash webinars.asp. This is the public page, of course. You don't need to be logged in. You don't need a current trial or subscription to access our archive webinars. If you go to powerop.com slash webinars.asp, it'll take you to the same page. Underneath the ops and strategies, there is a full presentation here on our concepts of managing your spread positions. And the management really comes into key whether you're doing what uh, Jack's doing here. If you're basing it off Delta, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Some of our investors will base it off of the net credit, meaning that if I originally collected, let's say, uh, 50 cents of net credit on a position, if my debit to close the position reaches 50% of that or goes up to 75 cents or 85 cents or so, then they may look to close the position. Other investors will use uh, stock information there as well. Um, uh, what I mean by stock information is that if I originally entered a bull put credit spread and I was looking for stocks that were trading above their 50-day moving average, if that trend reversed while I was in the trade, even if my spread was still out of the money, I may look to apply a management technique on that position. Okay, so I'm going to link now over to, we're just going to take Tesla Motors here. This is a current bull put spread with Tesla at 248.59. I could look to sell the May 240, this is the 29th of expiration, so two weeks out, the May 240 at 267, and buy the 237.5 for 215. Uh, this is going to be a 52 cent net credit against a risk of 2.5 points, uh, so the max return would be 26.3%. We're just going to link over to the profit and loss chart here to run some example scenarios uh, based on the profit and loss chart. Now, Tesla is currently at 248.84. Well, let's say we're at today's expiration, and I'm not sure if Tesla has even been in this range, but let's say a week or two weeks ago, uh, Tesla at 248, let's say Tesla was trading up at around uh, 250. Okay, so a couple weeks ago, let's say Tesla was trading a little bit higher than it is right now. Well, let's just say it was trading at 255. I'm sorry, so Tesla was trading at about 255. And at the time, let's say a couple weeks ago, I sold the 250 put and we'll say bought the 245. We'll keep it a five-point spread, and we're going to generate about 70 cents of net credit from doing that. Okay, so let's go up to the top here. Let's clear these out. So we'll take a bull put credit spread, and we'll go to today's date. And I would have sold the 250. Now, I'm sorry, let, I'm sorry, folks. Let me not do that. Let me not do that there. Let me go to the 22nd. Let's say two weeks ago. The stock was at 255. I sold the 250 put and bought the 245. And at the time when the stock was trading at 255, right now, uh, let's say we generated about a dollar 80 for the 250, and we paid a dollar 10 for the 245. So we're going to sell one 250, a dollar 80. We're going to buy the 245 at 110. So at the time, let's go ahead and submit that. We would have seen a spread with a potential for a 16.3% return, 
um, as generating 70 cents of premium against a risk of 430. So their max risk is $430 if it falls below 245 on May 22nd. And we could stand to make 16.3% Tesla stayed above 250 at expiration. But now, of course, what has happened? Stock's now trading at 248.84. So it's moved a couple points below our short put position, or it's got close. I know what you're saying, Jack, you'd want to manage it before it got there. But let's say this is our scenario here, so it's going against us. We know we have to manage it. In this case, uh, when I opened the position, I would have looked to manage the 250 put if the stock reached within one or one and a half percent in the portfolio tools. I would have set that as an, uh, as an alert to, to adjust the position if the stock maybe reached down to 251 or 251.50, that would have been an alert. Or I would have used the delta, as you mentioned, Jack, or I might have used something else as well. Okay, so but now it's gone beneath our put strike price. What are some of the opportunities that we suggest? Okay, well, I'm just going to sketch them down here first. Number one, the first rollout opportunity we discuss a little bit more in depth, or the first adjustments we discuss a little bit more in depth in that free webinar I showed you, Jack. First is close the position and take the loss. Okay, so we could just close it, take the loss, and we could look to go into another position. I'm going to jot these down over here too so I can get a quick example. Number two, well, another opportunity is we could close the spread entirely and we could roll down or roll down and out. So move the entire spread. What I mean by that, I might buy to close my 250 put, sell to close my 245, and maybe now sell to open the May 29th or the June 5th perhaps 245 put and then bought to open a 240. So I'd move sort of the spread down a strike to give me some more room to the upside. Uh, so we just call this close and move lower in this case or move higher in the case of a bear of call. So we close and move lower. Now, what is another opportunity that we could do? By the way, I'm not a fan of this. I go more in depth uh, into that into the uh, in the real presentation, in the full presentation, I should say. But just moving the strike prices down sometimes is a difficult pill to swallow because you were wrong on the direction of the stock. I picked a bull put credit spread. It moved against me. And I'm saying, oh, it can't go any lower, so I'll just move it down again. Well, the trend is reversed. It's moving down in price now from when we thought it was going to be stable or moving up. So as I keep rolling just the bull put down, I may be getting into further losses and further losses and continue to have to roll out to August and then out to September, and I'm not getting ahead of the game, okay? Number three, of course, we could close the whole position again, and now that the trend has changed, we could do the reverse. I could open a bear spread, okay? So I close my bull put, take a loss, and then try to make it back by selling a bear call now that the trend is reversed. Of course, the risk with doing that, closing and then turning it into a bear spread, is that, well, what happens in the next seven, eight days if that trend reverses and it starts to move back up to 250, 252, 255? Well, I may lose all my bear call spread as well. Okay, so four, if I still have time remaining in the position, as I do with this one, I could consider simply buying to close the short. Okay, so I could buy to close the short put. and leave the long open. So now if the stock continues to move against me, I'll have just a long put position. Now it'll be a higher price. I did pay 110 for it, but technically I received this put as a credit. But it might cost me as much as $3 or $4 to close this position now. So I took in 30, and if I close my short put for $3, that means I've got a debit of 230. So now I'm holding a long put that expires in seven days at 2.30. So I'd really have to have a bearish expectation continuing on to turn this into a profit. I need it at expiration to be at least 240, uh, I'm sorry, 242.70 there to get to that profit. Okay. Now, number five, there's another adjustment I talk about in the webinar where you could convert this into what's called a pendulum adjustment or apply the pendulum adjustment. And what the pendulum adjustment is, I'll just write pen down there. The pendulum adjustment is, is I'll leave the short option open. I'll leave the 250. I'll sell to close the 245 and buy to open a 255. So now what have I done? I've done a similar thing that we talked about in number three. I closed part of the position and opened another. Essentially, I just made a pendulum adjustment. I swung this put on a pendulum, my long put, 
And so what happens now is that I am in a bear put debit spread where as long as the stock stays below 250, I'll make a smaller profit. I still have the five point risk, for example, or close to it in that scenario. But the pendulum adjustment allows you to just make one transaction, roll one leg, instead of closing the whole spread and opening a bear call spread. We just have one commission to swing the put up and turn it into a bear put spread if our sentiment on the position has now changed. Number six, and my friend uh, John, who's online, he chimed in earlier. There he is, good. John is always uh, as good for the more advanced strategies when it comes to this. John mentions uh, a butterfly roll. Okay, John has brought these up before. There are ways to manage credit and debit spreads by converting them into a broken wing butterfly or a butterfly position. And of course, you could, one of the ways to do that is you could take this existing bull put spread that we have here, right? We have got our bull put credit spread here. Let me take a look there at the view. Okay, good. It's back to normal. We could take the bull put credit spread we have here and I could potentially add a bear call credit. That would just make it an iron condor, but I haven't solved the problem. But we could also add the debit spread here to convert this into a butterfly or a broken wing butterfly position, which would sort of move this out a little bit. It would just our break even slightly, so we might be able to get a better profit on the position. Uh, so six would be a butterfly or broken wing butterfly. And then seven, of course, there's some other more advanced techniques. I've, I've heard people of doing a long call condor. It wasn't a bull put? No. Yes. On a bull put credit spread, doing an all call condor, doing four more legs to repair the bull put that's moving against you. On a bear call credit spread, do an all put condor. Similar to the butterfly, but wider strikes. Not a fan of that. It's adding a lot of complexity and a lot of legs into the position as well. Um, but those are some of the ideas, and those are some of the things we talk about in that webinar. Okay? Um, so those, you know, your choice is close and take the loss. You could close and move it further down. Right, just roll the whole spread down as well. Jack, you had mentioned closing half of it. Okay, that is something that you could consider. You know, I could, if I had ten contracts, I could buy to close five. So now I only have, what do I have in this this situation? Well, I'm sort of at number four, but in a ratio scenario, aren't I? So if I had opened this spread with ten contracts of the 250 and ten contracts of my 245 uh, for my bull put credit spread, so ten and ten, and this is it. I'm sorry, 245, no, I'm sorry, that's the 250, and this is the 245. Um, so now the stock drops, I close, and now I only have five open here. So now I have the potential, sorry folks, forgot to put the phone on mute there. I've got the potential for a spread of five contracts apiece, and now I've got five long puts. So if the stock continues to drop, I'm not sure if this is gonna help you counter that. By just closing half, Unless there's a, a large drop here and it continues to move way down below 245, I'm not sure if the gain you're going to have in the long puts, the five long puts you left open, will counter the remaining loss you might take with the 5-5 five, five spread, including the loss you already might have taken to close the first half. So you'd have to work the numbers on that one, Jack. It'd be a little bit difficult, and you'd need a continued swing downwards. And in this case, if I was expecting that now the trend is completely reversed and I was expecting the stock to continue down to the 230 or 235 range, I may be better off just buying all the shorts and leaving the long open. Pendulum adjustment, kind of similar to what we saw here, but just moving that one leg, and you always move the long leg. You don't worry about the, sh don't move the short leg, just move the long leg here because you always want to keep the short as your pivot point. The pendulum, by the way, probably wouldn't work in the scenarios, Jack, that you're talking about. Um, the pendulum works best if the stock has breached your short put and is trading between the two strike prices, or in the case of a bear call, it's gone above the short call and is between the two strike prices. That's when the, the moneyness seems to work best for that pendulum adjustment by swinging the long and converting your bull put into a bear put debit with the higher strike long put now. And then you could also go further into analyze trading, uh, adjusting this into the broken wing butterfly or the butterfly repair. Um, and John mentions another one that's not as complicated as the all condors and all, uh, all put condors or all call condors I mentioned, a back ratio spread. So you're buying two and selling one. You're essentially adding a put um, to this position here. So you're adding a put to the current put there, converting this to a back ratio spread. Those are some of the things that you consider. Now, which repair is better than another? That depends on what the stock does after the repair. 
right? So if I move did number one, if I just close and take the loss, hey, I've closed and taken the loss, nothing happens, I've taken the loss, I've gotta make it up somewhere else. If I close and move down, so let's say I close this spread and move down to the 29th by selling the 245 and buying the 240, I'm gonna have a lower profit range, I'm gonna have a higher risk because I have to factor in the loss, and it's possible that this won't even be a profit. You wouldn't do this unless it was a profit to roll down. If you don't see a profit moving to the next expiration, going down to the lower strike prices after you factor in the, the cost of the loss there on the original spread, then you may have to go out four weeks, five weeks, six weeks out in time. Now you're sitting on a spread for a very long time period. But is this a good repair? Well, we're taking in a lower return, but we're maybe converting what would be a small loss right now into a potential gain if the stock stays around its current price range. We're still bullish on the position. That would have to be the sentiment, of course. Because if the stock does move back up, this repair, this adjustment would have worked. If the stock continues to fall, I'm still on the hook for that sort of five to one or eight to one risk reward ratio. I can lose more on this next bull put. Number three, closing and creating the bear spread position. Is this the, a better way to go? Well, if and only if, if I close this spread and then I take my bear call by maybe now selling the 250 and buying the 255, sorry, that's a terrible graph, <laughs> little hiccup there. Um, but by doing this now and converting it to a bear call, closing the original, converting to bear call, if the stock stays below 250, yes, this is a good repair. The stock moves back up, starts to swing again, now we're losing on the bear call side, and that's not a good repair. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. All these repairs are kind of dependent on what happens next. Same with our, our pendulum adjustment. I'll swing this 245 put out to a 255. This will give me a smaller profit here. I keep the same pivot point at 250 for my short position. And again, this would be similar. It'd be a similar risk reward profile to closing this bull put for loss and opening the bear call, but now you only have the one transaction by doing the pendulum adjustment. So we still have a reasonable profit to potentially make to turn a loser into a winner if and only if the stock stays below the short put strike price now. If it moves back up, we can lose again on this side. And then the butterflies might bring this loss up You'll have a peak profit and loss chart as you do right now anyway. It might be a little bit lower than what your maximum potential was. But again, if the stock stays within the range, you'll make a profit. Okay, So it depends on what happens next after you make the adjustment. And the ratio backspread would be similar. Um, you'd have more of a profitable range perhaps in this direction. Yeah, in that direct. No, I'm sorry, in this direction um, as well. And you'd have a lower potential return up here. Uh, so it, it'll lower the risk potentially. And at the same time, it'll lower the potential return, but you're trying to turn a loser into a winner. So those are the essential ways that I look at to manage the spread once one of those triggers has been hit. Check out that webinar again on the free webinars page. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> on the free webinars page, uh, powerup.com again slash webinars.asp. Click on option strategies. Um, and check out the managing your spread positions there for a little bit more information. Okay, uh, Rhonda, you, your question wasn't important, but I actually have two to get to, but I'll sort of answer yours right now, and then I'll get to the Frank's question that came in. Rhonda asks, and I've never had this happen before, but it's great, she's multitasking. Does Schwab show the same options information as Options Express? Um, and she says, sorry for the question. I'm watching a Schwab webinar at the same time. I think that's the first time it's ever happened, but I think it's great. Um, I am not clear on exactly how they did that. Um, I have had an Options Express account for about 11 years now. I remember some subtle changes were made to what I was used to seeing on my Options, quote unquote, Options Express platform when they transferred it over. Um, but I don't know how Schwab changed theirs, okay? Um, I don't know exactly what the distinction is between the two platforms, how well they merged them or melded them together when Schwab bought out Options Express. Um, but the data is gonna be the same. I think you might have, in Options Express itself, I think you might have better holdover tools from before the merger that might give you a little bit better calculation. I'm assuming Schwab took some of that into their accounts too for their options traders, but I'm not 100% positive, Rhonda. Okay, and again, I'll say that the uh, the most common uh, questions, or the, not questions, but the most common uh, mentions I hear from Power Options subscribers and radioactive traders um, about, uh, 
I'm sorry, the brokerages they use. Uh, Thinkorswim is probably the most common name I hear mentioned from our customers here at Power Options and Radioactive Trading. Uh, Options Express might be second. Options House is gaining ground, and they just bought out Trade Monster a little while ago, who was also gaining ground. So Options House slash Trade Monster. Interactive Brokers is also very popular as well. Um, I hear the name E-Trade a lot. That's another account that I use. They don't have the, honestly, they don't have the best tools. Um, but this is why I use Power Options. Um, I just use my Fidelity account. All I do in my Fidelity account is place the trade with my limit order. By the time I log on to Fidelity, I've already decided what new position I'm opening, what position I'm rolling to if I have an open position, what adjustments I'm making, and I've decided that or made those conclusions using the Power Options tools, the portfolio tools, and maybe the custom spread or profit and loss chart as well. Um, so I just use Fidelity to make the trades. I do some stock research there from time to time, uh, but in general, everything I do is here at Power Options. So, um, yeah, but Options Express is up there as well, Rhonda, and I'm not sure exactly uh, what they have available. Let's see here. Let me get screen down here. Oops, sorry. One second. Oh, Paul says, I got onto the webinar late, and I think I just showed it again, Paul, but I'm not positive. Paul says he got on board late, so I don't know what webinar you're referring to. Uh, when was the webinar presented? Okay. So, uh, again, the free webinars page, Paul, it's at up here, poweropt.com slash webinars.asp. If you check the chat window uh, from at 438, you see I sent another chat with that link. It's a public link, but if you're logged on your Power Options account, you just got to go home and free webinars. On the you have tool section, option strategies, option concepts, and requested topics. Under the option strategies, Managing your spread positions. That was a webinar back from November of 2014, and it discussed the uh, similar rollout opportunities that we did here, just not as in depth. Uh, I'm sorry, what we just did was not as in depth as what's presented here on the managing your spread positions presentation. And the managing your spread presentations doesn't talk just about the credit spreads, it talks about the management of the debit spreads as well, with similar discussion. But there are certain repairs that we just talked about that work for a credit spread but do not work for a debit spread. And we talk a lot about parity trades, comparing a uh, bull put credit to a bull called debit before actually entering the position. Okay, Frank asks, for a trade to be fully bulletproof, and what he's talking about there is the radioactive trading concepts, of course, where we start off the position with a stock plus put combination. We'll make adjustments on uh, that position after adjustments are made um, we can bulletproof the position. So what he wants to know is, do you have, do you, does the stock have to move in your favor before the options are applied? I say yes. And Ernie and I were just talking about this. I've got a couple examples I can run for you. First, let me see. Who's, who is, I'm sorry, folks. I'm looking for something here. Oh, that expired a while ago. Let me take that one. That was the March 40. Position actions expire lag. I'm going to take a look at Blackhawk here for a moment, okay? And Blackhawk is one of my existing trades, one of my uh, married put trades I'm in right now. I'm going to take a look at the profit and loss chart. And you see here the position is bulletproof, meaning that originally, this might have been original, um, originally we bought the stock at 32.79. No, it's not. I apologize. I bought the stock at 32.79 and I bought a 35 put. As the stock moved up in price, I rolled to a higher strike put, which cut my risk down from 5% down to about 2%, and then I was able to sell one or two calls against it uh, over a two-month period to where I reduced the remaining at risk. So the original, let's go back to the portfolio, and I'm going to go into what's called the analysis view. Okay, and Hawk. There we go. Oh, no, it was actually 240 calls, one at 105 and one at 80. That paid for it on this position. Okay, so that was the original position, 34.64 on the stock and 7.10 on the 40 put. Okay, so let's go back to the custom spread here. And my original position cost when I opened this was 34.64. Okay, and we had the June 40 put. It's coming up to expiration. I've actually made this a conversion right now. All right, so here's my original risk at 4.2% or $1.74. Now, when I opened this position, mind you, the stock wasn't at 37.95. It was at 34.64, somewhere around here, okay? And I had the 40 put. 
So I couldn't sell the 40 call at that time because it was only worth five cents. I had to wait for the stock to move up before it made sense to generate a decent premium. And the first premium we generated was $1.05. I waited for the stock to go up to about $38.90 to $39.10. It was somewhere in that range. That wasn't my target price. I just made that first trade when the stock was around $38.90 or $39. So although this is the June expiration, let's simulate what this would look like. It's not going to give us the profit. No, that's not going to give us the profit and loss chart I want. Let me extend this out here. I'm going to add the September 40 put here, and I'm going to put that at 710. Okay, so here would be my original married put, but I'm, I'm forcing it to be further out in time so you can see a proper risk graph. Same risk, 4.2% from my cost basis at 34.64, and the 40 put, which was about $5.36 in the money, had a premium of 710. 536 of that was intrinsic value. The remaining dollar and an 80 or so dollar and 70 was the time premium. That was my risk, the dollar 74 was my time premium, and that's the true risk on the married put. Now, as I mentioned, I waited for the stock to move up, and I sold the near term, not 40 put. Got my mind set on, on puts now. I sold the 40 call for $1.05, okay? But I waited until the stock was had moved up in price following the rules in the blueprint. So the stock's trading there, and I was happy with this result. So if the stock continued up to 40, I could make a max of 4.7, but at a wide break-even range now between 46.36 and 34.97. And at the time, my SEGA model, the decision-making process I used, Frank, to decide when to make an adjustment, was I didn't think at the time that Blackhawk, I thought Blackhawk was going to be could stay within the range of the next 30 days between about 37.50 and 41.50. And I was going to be okay with that for this income method number one trade. And look at my risk now. It's down to 70 cents, or 1.7%. Well, that call expired worthless, so we take a dollar five off of this, so now we'd have a cost basis of thirty-three fifty-nine. And of course, what happened actually when this when that call expired worthless is a little bit off there, sorry. But when that call expired worthless, the stock was trading down around thirty-six. It had pulled back. Well, now the stock's at thirty-six, and this was around February or so. And I didn't want to sell the forty call because it didn't have enough premium. Okay. So I waited, and then later on, on uh, oh no, it was it was middle of February 217. We saw the opportunity to sell the May 15 for 80 cents. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that. Sell the May at 80 cents. I guess I have to pick the right strike, huh? So in this case, uh, let's just use May again, and so we sold the 40 call at 80. Okay, now, and again, now that got us to the bulletproof status we're in right now. That call eventually expired worthless, and we're holding a bulletproof position. Okay, so we took another 80 cents off of our cost basis here. Cost basis now at 32.79. Once that call expired worthless, it may. Okay, but then what I did actually before that, that was actually a February uh, in the radioactive trading. It was the March call that expired. Okay, so we're left with that position we saw, bulletproof to the tune of $11 or 0.3%. But I was coming quickly, my real position is the June 40 put, I was coming up quickly to expiration, and then Hawk had moved up recently, you see it's at 37.95. So a few days ago, what I did is I just decided to, to bite the bullet, and I just sold the 40, actually I think I got a better price than that, I think it was 65 cents. 70, and I think it was 65, but I sold the June 40 call to create a conversion. Now, at the time I sold this new call that I'm currently in, the June 40 call, and I have the, the, the June 40 put, uh, that's not going to look right. Um, I'll add it back in, sorry. Let me add it back in for you. Okay, so at the time, before I sold this call, I, could, I had the guaranteed profit of 0.3 or 0.4 percent. I could liquidate for a gain of 0.7 or 0.8%. Keep in mind, my cost base was 34.64. The stock has moved up, but I've lost some value on the put. So what I decided to do was just one last thing to generate some premium. As I went ahead and I sold, that looks about right, the June 40 call for 65 cents. Now, essentially what I've done, since I could only liquidate for a 0.8% gain, I was bulletproof to 0.3%, meaning if I held it to June, the remaining time value on the put would disappear. But by selling the call, I've simply just created a conversion. So I'm going to sit on this position for the next 30 days. No matter what the stock does, I'm going to make 
doesn't sound like a lot, but it's because the stock didn't move up as much as I thought it was. I was looking for it to move up to $40 per share. It came close to it once, but then pulled back. It was as low as $33 at one point in the trade. And I could have tried to do other adjustments, but I didn't. There are adjustments that you can be used if the stock falls in price from when you first opened the RPM or the stock moves down. Now, all that being said, do I have to wait for the stock to move up? We advocate for all of the bullish income methods, which is one, three, four, five, six, essentially 11 as well. You want to wait for the stock to move up before applying an adjustment. And let me just take this one example. I'm just going to take the first one. Don't even know what it is. But here's a married put set up from the top of the search list. We could buy CRTO, 100 shares at 48.29. And at the same time, I could buy a far out in time October 50 put at 6.10. Now, this makes my cost basis 54.39. I am holding the 50 put. And my risk is 8.1%. Now, at this point, you might say, okay, well, why do I want to wait for the stock to move up? Let me sell a call right now. Well, if we go to June and we look at the 50 call, it's got a premium of 125 to 160. But in general, I want to make sure I'm collecting at least a third to a half of my original at risk. I don't want to feel forced to sell the call too soon or to do any of the adjustments, even income method number six, the bear spread, which leaves the upside open. Why not? Well, the reason why is that when I originally opened this position, it would have been because I, after doing my research analysis, I would have had a sentiment that CRTO was probably going to gain, or hopefully was going to gain by my analysis, maybe 5 to 8% in the first 30 to 60 days, okay? Oh, wow, there's a lot of questions that came in, so uh, I'm going to pick up the pace here. But, so if I sell the call right now, as soon as I open the position, I could still realize a profit, but now I have two ways to lose. And remember, if I was thinking the stock was going to move up, let's say, 5 to 8 percent, it's at 480, so I would have expected the stock to be around maybe uh, $51 or closer to 8 percent, would have been maybe up towards um, $52 or $53 per share right at that second break even. Okay, that would be the high end. Okay, so I'm going to be in here or here. This is where I thought my stock was going to be trading. And I've put myself at a gain of only 1 percent because of the obligation of the short call. Did I reduce my risk on the downside by that $1.25? Absolutely. I've taken this downside risk down to about 5.9%. However, I've given myself two ways to lose, and I've handicapped the position after my expectation. And what do I mean by that? Well, we get a lot of comments during the radioactive trading webinars that say, I don't understand why you're buying the put option. That doesn't make any sense. You're trading against yourself. You're in a bullish position, and you're buying a bearish sentiment. Okay, well, if you're trading covered calls, I'm sorry, that's the same argument, all right? You've, you've bought a stock, and then you've sold a call against it, and selling a call is a bearish instrument, so you've done the same thing. You could argue that covered calls is trading against yourself if you're bullish because you've capped the gain. This isn't trading against myself. This is insuring an investment, okay? So I'm insured an investment, so if the worst-case scenario happens or the market falls out of bed, I can only lose 5 6 or 7%. By the way, the max risk I take on any position personally is about 7.5% in the strategy. So... This isn't trading against myself because I'm bullish. I think that in the next 30 to 45 days, the stock's going to be trading up in this range, which will be at a profit at the halfway point because the put's not decaying one-to-one -one with the stock as well. Like buying a house and getting insurance for it, John says. That's exactly right. Or if you invest in fine art and you buy insurance for it, that's what you're doing. Now, so to me, this is not trading against myself. This is insuring an investment. This, going to June selling the 50 call right now for a small premium. And it's not even a small premium. It's a pretty decent premium for a 30-day out position on a $50 stock. This is trading against myself. Is my return 2.5%? Yes, if and only if the stock's trading right at $50 on June expiration. If the stock moves up to where I thought it was going to be trading, I'm looking at a profit of $4, $5, or a loss even where I would have had a profit the other way. So by selling the call too soon, trying to force an adjustment, that is trading against yourself. Um, oh, TC asks, uh, I'm sorry, this is a good question. TC had asked this a moment ago, um, and I just got to it. Is there a minimum premium you look for before adjusting? That's talked about in the blueprint. There's rules for each of the 
income methods that are applied, and I kind of gave one away here. I do look for about a third to a half of my original risk, not the new risk here, but my original risk. I look for at least a third to a half of that if I'm using income method number one, and around a third or a quarter if I'm using income method number six, for example. And in general, on the other side of that, I'd wait for about a four to five percent move on the stock, depending on the put price I selected, uh, to be able to do that. Okay, let's see. Do you typically open a Okay, and then TC, I'm going to get to that one next. That's a great follow-up. I'm going to get to that one next as well. TC's follow-up, and then I've got a question from Carl and then from John. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so to answer your question there, Frank, it's discussed in the blueprint. In general, I'm going to wait for the stock to move before applying one of the bearish income methods. doesn't always happen. What if I open the stock today at 48.29, and two weeks from now, the stock's trading at 45 or $46 per share? I may look at one of the bearish adjustments, income method number, uh, I apologize folks, income method number nine, a combination of nine and one, maybe six as well. Um, and if the stock stagnates for let's say 50 to 60 days after I open the position, I may apply income method number eight, income method number seven or number six. Number six is the most versatile. But then we got a quick follow-up question while we're here, uh, coming from the same situation, and TC wanted to know, do you typically open a bear call or bull put when opening the married put? No, I don't do a income method number six, the bear call. I never do a bull put on a Mary put. I'll show you why in a moment. And I also will never do income method number five, typically, when I first open a married put. Okay, why not? Well, again, I'm expecting, oh, sorry, let me, let me submit this here. Let's go back to our original Mary put. I open this position with the expectation my stock's going to be trading, let's say, at around $52 to $53 range in the next 30 to 60 days, Okay. And in near term, my profit might be here, okay, around $200 or so. Well, it's less than that. If the stock moves, no, no, four points. Okay, so if the stock moves up about four points, let's say to $52.50, I'd expect to have a $2.30 to $2.80 gain on the whole married put position that I could liquidate for that gain, okay? So I'll just put that down around $2.50 with a movement of about five point, uh, four points, okay? Now... Why wouldn't I do income method number six? Uh, many of you saw the free webinar from Kurt yesterday, saw this. There's no harm in me showing an example of it today. Bear call spread in the context of the married put generates premium for you, but it leaves the upside open. Unlike that income method number one I just showed, which caps the gain and can cause you two ways to lose if applied too soon at the wrong price. So here, let's say I just open this position today. Again, we're going to sell the worst price here. We're going to sell our 50, call it 125. And I'm going to buy the 55 for around 30 cents. If math works with me correctly. So we're going to get it close to a dollar net credit for this position, 95 cents. Okay. Was this the right time to do this trade? To me, no, it wasn't. Okay. Do I have infinite upside potential by applying income method number six at these prices right away? Yeah but only if the stock moves above 56.14 in the next 30 days. My expectation was it was going to be trading in this range. And what's in this range? A loss, okay? By applying it too soon, not allowing the stock to move, and not getting a good enough credit, I now have two ways to lose. I can still lose on the downside, but I hedged that a little bit down to 6.5% from the 80, uh, 95 cents we collected. But if the stock moves up to where I thought it might be trading, I'm looking at a gain of only a dollar or two or a loss, and a loss here of probably about $50, okay? So I'd have to manage the short position, the long options expiring worthless, or it's also in the money, but until 56.30, I don't get advantage of that infinite upside. I don't want to have two ways to lose, especially in one of these ways is in, I hate to say it this term, but a lot of people use it. If it's in that probability cone, Okay, where the stock might likely be trading in the you know plus or minus two to three percent or plus or minus four percent in the next thirty to sixty days. I've put myself in a losing position. And again, if the stock reaches fifty, that's great, but I've maxed out my potential return here at that point between fifty and probably fifty six thirty, but it's really closer to fifty seven, isn't it? It's probably gonna be about twenty to thirty dollars. All right, so that's why I don't do this right away. If I had the expectation that the stock was not going to go above 50 in the next 30 days or 60 days, well, I probably wouldn't have opened a married put on the position. But this would be an adjustment you could use because you're expecting the stock to stay below it. Now, why don't I use a bull put? Well, because the bull put doesn't function the same way as the bear call. 
income method number six works with an infinite upside and taking no extra risk, no extra margin, because the stock is covering the short call and you just end up with a long call at a credit. But with the bull put credit spread, the long put that you already have, the married put, the part of the married put I purchased, can only cover one side or the other. It can't cover both. So if I opened the 45 spread here, I sold the 45 put, let's say at 85, and I buy this at 20. All right, so let's go 85 and 20. We'll get 60, 65 cents of net credit. And remember, my original risk was 8.1%, I believe, on this position. Now my risk is 16.3%. Why? Yes, I'm expecting the stock to move up. Yes, I've kind of trying to double dip with the net credit, but if the stock falls, I lose on the married put and I lose in this five point spread. If it starts to drop below 45, goes down to 42, or if, it, heaven forbid, it goes below 40, I've lost the five points on the spread and the time value I originally had on the married put, which was 8%. So we've taken our risk up to 16.3%. So as bullish as I am on my stock and as confident as I am with my research analysis, I don't use the bull put credit spread when I first opened the married put because I don't want to take the risk. The whole point of doing it was to keep the risk in single digits. I'm putting my risk here at 16.3%. So you actually never use, eh, I can't say that. You don't ever use a bull put credit spread by itself in radioactive trading. But those of you on the blueprint, you know about income method number eight and what can be applied there. Uh, John says, uh, I think there's one, sort of this discussion, back ratio with touching strikes for uh, even better. And uh, that's kind of discussed around income method number eight as well. Okay. Oh, he's saying the alternatives is a risk reversal trade or a back ratio spread uh, for stock replacement. Um, what, what John's been doing is using the sort of a synthetic, but more of kind of a back ratio spread to mimic stock ownership and have the put in there. I had a group of investors who attempted to do that. They were using the synthetic stock instead of buying the stock outright to create the buried put to have lower leverage. And within a month and a half or so of uh, playing around with different positions and tracking them side by side in the portfolio tools and then their brokerage tools, they decided to abandon the synthetic and stay just with the radioactive trades. Um, they didn't tell me why. Um, they just said that it was actually looking at a better profit on the married puts than it was on the synthetic. That's not what John's doing. John's doing something a little bit different, not just the synthetic stock. It's kind of close. Okay, sorry. So let's move on now. We've got John who's been waiting patiently. John O who's been waiting patiently. Last week I listened on Iron Condor Part 1 with Mike Phillips. I forget his name. We said you could purchase the Iron Condor newsletter for $99. Um, does that mean I cannot find good candidates for Iron Condor? No, 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 no. That's not what it means at all, uh, John. <clears throat> One of our other services that we offer, you've heard me talking about radioactive trading where you can get the Fusion subscription to follow our married put trades and also the Blueprint. But in addition to that, one of the other services that is uh, operated by Power Options, or the Power Financial Group, I should say, is Power Options Applied. And the website for that is poweroptionsapplied.com. And what this is here, this is not on Power Options. It's a separate site. But we offer two services. There's the uh, Optium Trade Folio and the Titanium Trade Folio. The Optium trade folio is one of the two that was open at the time you saw that old webinar. It was Optium and Chromium. They sort of just merged together, John, and became Optium. Uh, Optium, I believe, is $89 per month, and roughly one to three spreads are selected per month um, for credit spreads. It's not done as an iron condor anymore. It, iron condors are used, but it's not done as an iron condor, and let me explain why. Over the course of the seven or eight years of doing this portfolio, uh, we realized that the portfolio would do better, get more profit, when the position is entered as a bull put credit or a bear call credit, and then legged into the iron condor later on. And that's because of the way that the selection process was done and looking at the different indexes that we used, there were actually times when it was better to wait uh, for what they've determined, their proprietary selection at the timing for entering a bear call or bull put on one of the broad-based indexes, but not to the iron condor first. I mean, that almost sounds the opposite of what you'd think would happen, but what they're trying to do is not so much leg in and leg out of it, but just do the bull put as you're expecting, and then as the stock moves up and you get the premium you want, you actually wait for the stock to go in the direction where it hurt the bear call, then you look to add the bear call 
or reverse. You look to do the bear call when it's looked like it's at a peak of its trading range, and as it falls, you look to enter the bull put when there's a better credit that can be achieved with still the same probability or higher that you originally had as you get closer to expiration. Um, but, so it's not straight iron condors anymore. The Optium trade folio power options applied is using the credit spreads. It says here bull put, bear call, and iron condors there, but they leg into them. They usually open one side of the spread or the other, and then later on, seven days later, eight days later, they may add the other side to complete the iron condor. Okay? All right, Carl asks here, let me clear this out and I'll show you right away. Carl asked, on credit spreads, how is the percent probability calculated? Oh, I thought you asked about return. Okay, so the return simple here. It's the, the net credit divided by the margin requirement, where the margin requirement is the difference in the strike prices minus the net credit. But Carl was asking about the probability. And it's not calculated for credit spreads, Carl. It's calculated for every option, okay, the probability. Uh, so let's go to a chain for AAPL here, okay? And... Uh, da -da. Yeah, this is today's, right? Yeah, let's go to next week's. Let's go to May 22nd here on the small chain. And I'm going to look at the puts only for the time being. There we go. Does that help? Yeah, okay. So we see here it doesn't help, actually. Oh, no, it's kind of okay. So with Apple currently, I'm sorry, at 128.77, we see that our 128 put has a 58.3% probability of expiring worthless. Okay, the 127 is at 68 and a half. As we go further down out of the money for the next seven days, the 124, we're at a 90% probability and so forth. Okay, now the probability is calculated for every option. The theoretical probability of overblow is calculated for every option in the database. What essentially you're looking at is the common equation that's used for probability, um, and not the static probability, not the Monte Carlo or ever probability, just the static probability of expiration. It's kind of based on the 52-week uh, trading range of the stock. And based on the 52-week trading range of the stock, we can take a standard deviation of those values, apply a bell curve, and based on that bell curve, we can say, okay, what is the likelihood that the stock would be at X or Y in the next seven to 10 to 15 days? based on past historical performance. Our equation does do something a little bit different. We do factor in the current implied volatility of the at-the-money options and the in-the-money and out-of-the-money options for the near months to factor in uh, current situations. If earnings are coming up and the implied volatility is inflated, that would have an effect on the probability. Some other services don't do that. They just look at the straight 52-week, or uh, sorry, yeah, 52-week historical trading range or what you might call the SMA, uh, I'm not the SMA 50, the 52-week volatility, for example. But we actually take into account the near-term implied volatility as well to factor that into our equations. Okay. Now, how is this? How is the probability calculated for a spread? It's not. Any combination of the 127 put. If I did a bull put by selling our 127 here, and let's say buying the 125, my probability would be 68.5%. If I sold the 127 and bought the 120, my probability would be 68.5% because what I'm looking for is the probability above the short option. That's all it relates to. Okay, so the probability of success is what we're talking about here. The theoretical probability the stock would stay above both put strike prices and then expire worthless. So any combination with the 127, whether I did the 125 or whether I did a bull put with the 123 and the 127 or if I did the 127 and the 120, for example, all three of those spreads would have the same probability of 68.5% because the 127 is our pivot point. But it's calculated using that 52-week trading range, applying a standard deviation to those values, allowing us to apply the bell curve to that position to see where our position would be at that time. Okay? All right. Let's see. Oh, okay. Okay, John, I, I have to put in John's comment too. Now, John's not wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying John was wrong about what he's doing in his portfolio. I'm not saying the, the attempt to look at the synthetic is wrong either. John has a point that it's much better return on your capital. Well, of course it is. That's the lie of leverage. It's also a much higher percentage risk on each position. Okay? Is it monetarily the same? Yes. Is it percentage-wise the same? No. Can you get into trouble by overtrading if you're not disciplined? Yes. Many investors who I talk to who are in the situation where they need radioactive trading they're in that situation because they weren't disciplined. And when they were looking at covered calls and say buying a $50 stock and selling a 50 call against it and putting in, let's say, $10,000 for 200 shares to make that trade, 
they learned about bull puts and they saw that, oh, I could sell the 50 put and buy the 45 put, but now I only have to put up five points or $500 for one contract, which means I can trade 20 contracts or 10 contracts now on that bull put credit spread and make a higher leverage return of 20 to 30% because I'm taking in a dollar on a five point risk, a 25% return. And then the stock drops to 44 or 46 even, and they've realized that yes, the leverage gave you the ability to trade more contracts, but in the spread position, you're risking 100% of what you invested into that trade, whereas in the covered call, you're still risking 100%, but only if the stock drops to zero. And the discipline is where so many investors get into trouble because they're brought into that lie of leverage uh, that can cause them problems. But John's absolutely right. The synthetic will give you more value. And he says, max loss with the whisks of strikes is equal to the same. It is, the monetary one, but then if you start entering more contracts, that's where you get a problem. And Carl says, but I see a column for probability above on the bull put credit spreads. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what I'm talking about here too on the chain. On a put chain, it's the probability above. The theoretical probability that the stock would stay above 127. Okay, let, let's go take this into account. My 127 spread here. Now let's do this a different way for you, Carl. Let me go into the search by symbol. Bull put credit, search by symbol. And I want to go to all weeklies for now, less results. And that's not going to be enough. I've got to go to more results. All right, so here's all the combinations. Real quick, here's a good example that's not going to show because I don't have it selected. Hold on a second. Choose more columns. So for the bull puts, we'd want the percent probability above. That's what we want. We want the stock to be above both strike prices. In the bear call, the, the search filter is called probability, but the system knows that in a bull put, you're looking for probability above. In a bear call, you're looking for probability above below okay so here probability above look at my first two trades I could sell the May 128 and buy the May 127 for a 30 cent net credit on a dollar strike difference could sell the 128 and buy the 126 for a 53 cent credit or 36 percent return and the probability is the same it's the exact same for both spreads why because we're just looking at the probability of the stock staying above 128 okay that's all that matters right well there's a lot of things that matter but what matters to us for max profit is the stock remaining above 128 doesn't matter if I use the 128 sell and the 127 buy the 128 sell and the 126 buy 128 sell and the 125 buy, I just want to know the probability is going to stay above 128, the theoretical probability above in both cases. And, and so that's what we're looking at there, Carl. And the same thing, if I went to the next spreads there on our one strike, if I sold the 127 and bought the 126 or 127 sell and buy the 125, we have the same probability, 68.5, which we saw on the chain, and that's that it would stay above 127 in the next seven days. Okay. All right. Oh, and John, of course, yeah, followed up with me. Position sizing is key. That's really key for every strategy. And if you're disciplined, those synthetics work for you. We talk a little bit about that in the blueprint as well. Uh, some investors have a better stomach for it than others, and some investors have a better discipline than others. Okay. All right. So let's see here. TC says, you mentioned earlier that you use the RPM method for 65 your portfolio. What are you doing with the remaining 35%? If RPM is a great trading method and provides bulletproof trading, why not trade it 100%? Um, okay, it's because I like to do other things for income, okay? On average, my personal experience with radioactive trading over the past seven years, my annual return is around 10%. Some years a little bit less, some years a little bit more. I believe last year was 11, the year before that was 12 and a half uh, annual return with the married put portfolio. Uh, the year before that it was nine, okay? But it's always kind of in this range, 10 to 11% on average. Um, now, the radioactive trading strategy is the most conservative thing, in my opinion, that you can do short of not being in the market. <laughs> um, but it's conservative because it's a guaranteed limited risk. Collars offer a guaranteed limited risk. And what John mentions, credit spreads, as we just saw the profit and loss there for a credit spread position, this is a guaranteed limited loss. 
if you follow proper position sizing, which most people don't do. Most investors, I should say, don't do that. They overinvest in these positions and take on too high a risk in each of the leveraged spread trades. Okay, So this is a dialed-in max risk. So is buying a call, but it's leverage, and leverage works both ways. The married put forces you into an ideal size trade where of my invested amount, I'm guaranteed not to lose more than 5 or 6% of it. On average, TC, I probably hold a married put position for three and a half to four months, about 120 days, because I have a long-term projected growth over that time period. There may be a month or two that passes where I don't do any adjustments or generate any income. One of the recent married puts I, I closed uh, at the beginning of this year, I had held for about five and a half months, and my return when I closed, oh, I'm sorry, it was four months, four and a half months, and my average return on the position was 9.9%. So it was a little bit above 2% per month. However, there were three of the five, three of the two and a half of the four and a half months, or about two writing cycles, where I made no adjustments and generated no income on the position. Okay, so you could say, oh, you're not making any money. Because the stock was moving up and I was making unrealized profit, and I could make adjustments to lock that in later when I thought I'd hit the peak or when my adjustment criteria was met, but I didn't. Okay, so what am I doing with the other 35%? It's a combination of standard collars, which do also give me a limited risk protection, but I'm generating income up front, which actually helps my position and doesn't hinder it like the married put if I did it too soon. I do a few small percentage of my portfolio, about 10% of my portfolio now, with calendar call spreads. I'm buying an in-the-money call and selling at or out-of-the-money calls against it and credit spreads only on the broad-based indexes and ETFs. I don't do them on stocks. I do them on the broad-based index and ETFs. Why? Because those strategies still have good probability, still have dialed-in risk if you're careful with your position sizing, and it's generating income in the short term. So my uh, credit spreads on my indexes, my standard collar positions, and the calendar spreads are consistent income generations with about the other 30 to 35 percent of my portfolio whereas with the married puts I'm looking for longer term growth so why am I not doing more of this income strategies I've just talked about why am I not using 65 percent of my portfolio in those instead of the married puts it's because I've been trading for 11 years this by the way TC is what I do on a general basis meaning that during the week during the trading day I am on my computer all day I have both screens up in front of me but I'm very rarely looking at my Power Options account and my positions. I'm hosting webinars, I'm writing articles, I'm handling coaching sessions, I'm doing co-webinars with Kurt or other strategies we work with, okay? And, uh, oh, John, that's a good point. John, I would really, if you have any links to that, I'll share that with the audience later on, but I'd really like to see that because I've heard some opposite things about that, but that's okay. I'd, I'd like to see the research you're pointing to, but let me go back to my, my thought here. So I started out just as many of you did. When I first started, I was qualified to trade covered calls. I did that for about an 18-month period. And what I realized is what many of you have also realized. I was doing really good for the first three to four months. I was right on 70 to 80% of my trades, getting assigned. I wasn't married to the stocks. I take my profit, roll it to the next position. Well, in the fourth or fifth month in, I only have a 50-50 win-loss ratio. Half of my positions got assigned. The other half fell in price, and I had to manage them. And Two to three months later, I'm starting to do good, getting assigned on the positions I wanted to, still managing the losers there, and then I have another 50-50 win-loss ratio. So now 75% of the covered calls I'm in are being managed, and I'm only opening 25% new positions for the 2 to 2.5% income. So I realized that I wasn't getting ahead, and I wasn't making uh, a lot of profit on the positions, okay, long term. I've been trading covered calls for 10 months now, and it's essentially at break-even in my total portfolio. And a lot of the gurus out there say, oh, you don't care about that. You don't care if the stock falls. You just keep getting premium. I absolutely care about that. I want my portfolio to grow. I'm not using the income coming in to pay for my bills and live my life. I'm trying to grow this account. Covered calls is not a growth strategy. It's not a wealth option. It's a near-term income stream. Okay? It's not projected for long-term growth because it's a sorting machine. The stocks you pick that are winners get called away from you at a lower price, and the ones that are losers stay in your account, and you're forced to manage them for a longer period of time. Gamma strategy. Uh, John, sorry, I just, just stumbled across that. <laughs> John just mentioned that in there. Um, okay, so now in light of that, I branched off from that point, TC, and I started trading naked puts, which John has brought a few comments in. So I'm sorry I'm getting distracted, but I saw John's comments. So I was curious about those. Naked puts, you can go out of the money. Or you can go at the money if you want, but most investors go out of the money. And the idea is I sell a put, I get a little bit more protection on a covered call 
because the stock can fall. It's like trading an in-the-money covered call. It's the same exact risk-reward profile as a covered call strategy. But I'm looking to generate premium. If the stock stays above my put strike price, the put expires worthless and I keep the money. And if the stock falls in price over time, uh, then I may just be put the stock and then I can repair it later. John had made a comment, says numerous studies show the naked put strategy proves the best returns over the long run, requires diversification and proper position sizing, of course. Um, and I said that I'd like to see those studies because I traded that for 12 months and it had the same issue. And I was trading covered calls at the same time. It kind of overlapped for a little bit there. And I love naked puts when they worked. But eventually... Even if you're managing correctly, you're going to have one or two stocks that fall against you. And here's an example. I had a customer this morning. Either an in-the-money covered call trade, where I buy the stock, let's say, at 50, and I sell the 47 and a half call, I get $3 worth of premium. So I'm making about a 1% gain if the stock stays above 47 and a half, and I have close to an 8 or 9% downside protection. My break-even, in this case, is essentially going to be around $47 per share, or a little bit lower. <clears throat> okay, so... 1% if assigned versus an 8% downside protection. At the same time, I could sell the 47.5 put for 50 cents. My requirement would be 47.50, so I'm looking at roughly the same 1.2% yield if the stock stays above 47.5. And I have about that same sort of protection down to 47, that $3 drop that the stock could do before I start losing money on the position. Now, where am I going with this? I opened 10 positions. Let me just clear this out for an example here. Yeah, why not? There's a naked put. This naked put play here, which is about a 0.8% yield, uh, the stock at 120, I know it's a small premium because it's a weekly, so that's not a fair assessment. Um, but yeah, so the stock's at 128. We sell the 128 put. If we go lower, you know, it'd be a smaller return there, 0.4, um, 0.5% for a weekly position, which isn't bad for a weekly position. But it's the same as buying the stock. You'd see the same risk reward profile of buying the stock and selling the 128 call in this case. It'd be about 0.8% return, and the stock can fall about 1% or 2%. But let's take, uh, I don't have the numbers here. I don't have a stock. Do I trading right at 50? Uh, let's use SWI. Is that the one? 48.98. Uh, that's not as where I'd want it to be, but we're going to sell the 47.5 put for 50 cents. Okay. Okay, so today I sold this put. It's a 1.1% yield. I'm going to get a little bit more premium on SWI because it's you know not at 50, it's at 48. But my break even is $47, so it's, it's about two dollars down here. So we're looking at you know roughly about five percent or so decline uh, on the position. But in any case, I opened 10 positions with that same risk reward profile, looking to make 50 cents um, and needing five point uh, five percent drop here. Okay. Eight of those 10 positions do exactly what I want. They stay above the strike price, and I make my 1.1% times 8. The ninth one sort of falls to its break-even at 47. I close the put, or I take assignment, so I'm right at a wash there as well. The third one, the 10th position, I'm sorry, so the eight positions there, the ninth position was a wash, and then the 10th position, actually, well, it wouldn't be 10th, but one of the 10 positions drops down to 44 or $43 per share. Okay, so I've got a $4 loss on that position, a four-point loss. Well, here we're talking about $0.50 cents times 8, which was our profit taken in. We canceled one of those 50 by buying the closest putter. It's a wash. Okay, so here we make $4. Here we lose $4. Okay, now I could own the stock now at 43 and it's, you know, my cost basis is 47 It's at 43 I could try to manage this and, and do that. But what are we looking at here? I was right 90% of the time, really 80 to 85% of the time, but I still came out of the month with a loss. Credit spreads are a little bit worse. They're more of a 10 to 1 risk-reward ratio if you're not careful. And that's where the position sizing that John has been talking about and I have been talking about as well. Is there an upward bias to the market where the naked put will work longer term? Yes, there should be in theory. And these studies were done on indexes and SPX. John, exactly. That's where I was getting to, and I, that's what I have to agree with. The great advantage of the Russell, SPX, the indexes and the ETFs I mentioned, which is what I only trade on my credit spreads, is because you're not subjected to those positions that will drop 20 to 30%. People love trading the credit spreads on the high-flying stocks, Tesla, Apple, Google, Amazon, Netflix. I get questions about those at least 10 times a week. If you're good, there's nothing wrong with them. If you're right, there's nothing wrong with them. But these are the positions that tend to move more frequently. There's more activity. 
they are subjected to outliers in the market. Is the index subjected to outliers? Sure. Global things, this and that, global economy, uh, threats of war, threats of uh, different things of that nature, uh, geopolitical events, absolutely. But you never see the SPX, the index of the RUT, drop for a boardroom scandal. Um, because of a, uh, I'm sorry, because of a boardroom scandal or rumor of a buyout or a pending patent lawsuit or anything like that. So yeah, that's exactly right, John. That's where I was uh, looking. And then there are new stocks like Netflix today. That's right, John. That's exactly right. So that's why when it comes to my credit spreads, I only trade them on the broad-based indexes and ETFs. And I do kind of agree with you, John, that looking at my historical record, I've done many more bull put credit spreads on the indexes than I have bear calls. Okay, um, and that's because of the upward market bias. But this is the problem when doing it on stocks with these things is that you look at a spread trading portfolio, covered call portfolio, there is the potential there to be right 80 to 85% of the time and still lose money depending on the one loss. Okay, and that, that, that's the risk with those. TC asks a follow-up question. What are your stance on collars? I, after this first year and a half or two years I, I was talking about with the covered calls and moving to naked puts, my next step was I moved to collars. So this was about nine years ago when I started trading the standard collars where I looked to buy a stock, and this is at 48.98 today. And what I do is I'm going to sell a one month out or a couple weeks out at the money call. So in this case, it'd have to be the 50 that I'm going to buy an out-of-the-money put. Now, this is I can tell you right now, this is not going to give me the risk-reward I want for the standard collar okay? position. But what does this do? This solves the problems you'd have with covered calls and naked puts. If I'm right, now I need more of an upward movement, but if I'm right, I can still make 3% to the upside. And if I'm wrong, if the stock really fell out of bed, dropped down to $46, $41, or $42 per share, I'm only losing 7.2% guaranteed, much better than a stop order. Okay, because if this falls, I can always get 45 for it. If the stock gap's open at 42, my stop is triggered, but I don't get filled at 45. You'd get filled at 42 with the standard stop order. So I have been using these for the largest portion of my career. Not the largest portion of my portfolio, but for the longest portion TC of my trading career. This solves the problems of covered calls, but what also happens? It still caps the gain. So if I picked right and this stock actually goes up to 53 or 54, now I might be forced to manage it sort of a pain of managing SWI, by the way, and I know this because I'm in a married put, is that it only offers five-point strike differences. So if the stock moves up to 51 or 52, I'm going to be tempted to buy to close this 50 call, but I can't really go up to the 55 because there's no premium. Okay, uh, So you have to wait for it to get closer to 55 before it makes sense to do the roll, and then you're paying too much to buy to close the 50, 50 strike. It caused me a headache a couple times in my radioactive trade. But the advantage, again, of the radioactive position is if I'm picking right more often than wrong, which I tend to do, not a lot, but I think it's about my track record on the fusion shows about, I think it's a 68 to 32 win-loss ratio. But when I pick the winners, I pick right. Did the stocks move up 5 to 8%, 69 to 70% of the time in that 30 to 60 day time period? And the married put solves that because I'll make more on the married put because the put doesn't decay one to one with stocks. So if the stock moves up 8%, I'll be able to close my radioactive trading position for that 4% gain or 3.5% gain where the collar might only give me 25 or 3%. And that's the trick, okay? That's the long-term trick with that position as well. Yeah, and, and Jack agrees with me. He says, I only do credit spreads on NDX, SPX, and the RUT. <clears throat> uh, only do puts and generally enter trades after a market pullback. Good. That's kind of what Ernie does too. Um, now, another question. I'm sorry, who was this? Uh, Lillian. What if you're on an index, buy a long-term put in the money, and then sell weekly puts against it at the same price? That's a calendar put spread. Uh, GDX now is at 28.72. Buy the 28 put and sell weekly 28s against it. Just heard someone trying that one. My calendar spreads are purchasing an in-the-money put and then selling the at or out of the money against it because I do not like the profit and loss chart of what are called the standard calendar spreads, the same strike spreads. Okay, so it's just a personal preference lane. This is why I never trade um, iron butterflies in my portfolio. Uh, I didn't want to buy that. I, what I want to do here, I want to go out to June. I'll, I'll use the one month out. And, oh, did it? GDX. Oh, you mean, what am I in here? Ah, sorry, folks. One second. That's the gold miners, 2072. So for the puts, I'm going to buy. Ah, let's buy the 21s. 
no, I don't want to do that. I want to do the 20.50. You're right. So the twenty dollar and fifty cent strike. I'm going to buy and sell. Now is that 22, 23? 22. Okay. All right, so we've got a June put, which is roughly 35 days to expiration. And we're selling one that's seven days out, so we can roughly sell this about five times. Okay, so five times 22, we should collect a dollar that would pay for it. I don't like that profit and loss chart. Okay, $23 maximum profit right at the, if the stock happens to be trading at 2050, I got a window here of only about a dollar, 1999 to 2106. Okay, so a dollar difference here on the position between the two break evens before I start losing money on the position. I'm familiar with calendar spreads. When these weekly started coming up, I tried different versions of applying my calendar screens to buying just a two month out or three month output and selling the weeklies against it or buying a one month output and selling the weeklies against it. I didn't find that I was doing any better than what I did. And it's because you get tighter break evens and say, oh, well, there's only seven days for the stock to move against you. Well, most of the time when a stock moves in the wrong direction, it's going to move in two days and this is going to be a large loss on the spread. I don't like spreads that have this peaked profit and loss chart. Uh, iron butterflies, um, things that you know will look like this, where you have a minimum profit range and this minimum upper to lower break even on the position. I'm not a fan of those. I don't trade them in my personal account, and that's why I don't do the same strike calendar spreads. I always do the diagonals, is what they're called, when you have different strikes. Uh, TC says, what's well, the best way to learn the radioactive methods? Well, if you pick up the blueprint, that's your first step. Uh, you've got to own the blueprint to see all the different income methods. And then I do feel that the next step, you get that first month discount at $10. Try that first month of Fusion to go through some of the extra lessons Kurt put together. You can follow Ernie's current radioactive trades and mine as well. Gives you a little bit of education. And what we most find is that most investors that buy the blueprint subscribe to Fusion within two months or so uh, after you know they go through their discounted rate and then go through another additional month or two they will move over to the um, power option subscription once they're comfortable there. And, uh, and John, of course, is uh, he says he hates these same strike spreads too. But in addition to that, even though John is using the synthetic and he's applied his own uh, uh, tricks, I should say, and his own valuation to it, he says the blueprint should be bought by all investors. It is priceless. And so thank you for that, John. He's got the methods there and he's been doing them, but he's applying his own techniques to what his discipline is and how he can get the best bang for the buck, I guess is a good way to say it, uh, by using those different um, uh, sort of synthetics and the back ratio spread kind of thing that he mentioned earlier as well. Uh, so yeah, TC, I think that's the great that's a great approach is doing fusion for a month or two to go through some of the additional education we have. The fusion members only webinars, of course, you own the blueprint. You can have access to the blueprint owners only webinars as well. Uh, you get that great foundation in the blueprint, and then you can expand that with the fusion subscription. You can see how Ernie and I trade these positions in our personal account, as well as Kurt's uh, full track record from when he was posting all of his radioactive trades. He's still trading radioactively, he just doesn't post them as much anymore. Hmm. And then once you get comfortable enough with the techniques and the different situations, you can move over to power options where you can do the research and analysis on your own, run the what-if scenarios, of course, track the positions in the portfolio as well. Oh, yeah, and, and, and Rhonda says, um, that, see, there's a trick here that, that I always get people with, and, and I get myself with, oh, sorry about that, GDX. Um, Rhonda says, on a diagonal calendar spread, if you buy the in the money put, isn't that a downward outlook? Yeah. So if I went out to June here on GDX, the weekly, and I'm going to buy the 22 put, but at the same time, I'm going to sell a nearer in May 22nd, I almost hit the call there, uh, just out of the money, one here for 22 cents. Okay, so I'm sorry, what was the buy here? 156 to 167. Let's call it 164, and I'm going to sell this one. Okay, so this is a massive, my risk is to the upside. This is a downward position. You're absolutely right. But a diagonal spread, I buy in the money, but I don't usually do put spreads. I'm doing haul spreads. Okay, so I'm buying an in the money call and selling an at or out of the money call against it. Okay, um, and I'm looking to manage that long term, of course, not long term, but in over a few weeks to get the profit I want. Calendar put, the way I describe buying an in the money and selling the at is a downward basis. But a diagonal just means different strikes. 
doesn't mean in the money and at the money. A diagonal could be, I'm going to sell the May 2050 put weekly, and at the same time, we're going to go out in time, we're going to buy that June 19 put out of the money. So they're different strikes, okay? So this is still considered a diagonal spread, and I get this almost, in some cases you can get it as a credit, but now it has an upward basis. But before I entered this trade, you know what I'd have to compare it to? I would have to compare it to the debit I would pay for buying the 19 strike call and selling the 20 and a half call. Because this here, this calendar put spread, this diagonal spread where you've bought the out of the money put a few months out in time is a parity trade to the calendar call spread of buying the in the money call and selling the at the money call against it. Same strike that we'd sell the 2050, same strike that we'd buy the 19. The calls would be done at a debit, puts would be done at a slight credit here of $2, but the return and the risk reward profile would look similar, but they're parity trades, so I'd have to compare it. Okay, So that's the strange thing. Strange calendar, or a calendar put by itself, the same strike spreads are neutral positions. We saw that, just like an iron butterfly, a short straddle. It has that peak profit and loss chart. I prefer, I don't like them. I can do a calendar put spread, a diagonal calendar put spread that's bearish. I can do a diagonal calendar put spread that's bullish. I can do a diagonal call spread that's bullish. I can do a diagonal call spread that's bearish if I buy the out of the money call far out in time and sell the near term call against it. So you can swing them any way to do that there, but my preference is to buy the in the money options if I'm doing a calendar put or a calendar call, which with a calendar call has a bullish basis and the calendar put has a bearish basis as well. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see any other questions coming in right now. And uh, we're right at that mark there, about 5.50 Eastern time. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone real quick, if you haven't done so yet, of course, go to powerop.com. Make sure you register for your 14-day free trial. The subscription services after that, of course, 20-minute delayed is $60 per month. Uh, if you want the upgrade from the 20-minute delayed to get access to the historical tools, that's $100 per month. And, of course, the, uh, we do offer the real-time service as well. Uh, coming up next week, Tuesday and Thursday at 12 noon Eastern Time, Kurt's going to host an introduction or a radioactive trading presentation. Tuesday will probably be more introductory. Thursday will be more involved into one of the income methods, one of the riskless spread trades, probably five or six. Uh, Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we'll be back here for another open discussion Q&A. And remember, you can view those archive presentations I showed you or we discussed at any time. Just go to powerop.com slash webinars.asp. That's a public page. You don't need to be logged in to access it. And then you can go through the tools archives, the um, options strategies archives, the options concepts archives, and the uh, requested topics as well. Now, if you think of any questions later on, just please feel free to give us a call. Remember, you can reach us at market hours um, during the day at 302-992-7971. Of course, you can send us an email at any time as well to just support at poweropt.com. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you next week at one of our other live presentations. Good night. Happy